I'm here today with writer-director uh, John Stevenson and actor Brian landis Fulkins, uh, whose new film, rent a pal is now available on demand and playing in select theaters. Brian, you played David, a lonely 40-year-old taking care of his elderly mother in 1990, who discovers a strange VHS tape at his video dating service. He takes it home and finds out that his new rent-a-pal, Andy, played by Will Wheaton, may be a bit more than just a pre-recorded motivational speaker. Um, John, the eeriness of rent-a-pal is twofold. One, that you were able to uncover an aspect of 90s dating culture that just about perfectly mirrors dating in the social media era. But second is that we now find ourselves further isolated in this new age of lockdowns and social paranoia how did you first make the connection between VHS love connection tapes and online dating? And has the film taken on new significance for you now that it's coming out smack dab in the middle of a pandemic? Yeah. Um, the timing of the film has been interesting in, in a lot of ways, but um, we, uh, the, the film features this company video rendezvous. It's the dating service that David uses. And the idea is that when we, when I thought of Rent-A-Pal, I was like, all right, where would you buy this tape? And you could buy it at, you know, a Blockbuster or a video store, or, uh, you know, a family video store or Columbia House or something. But uh, we landed on uh, a dating service just because dating and relationships is what the movie's about. And so it just seemed, seemed to add a lot to that uh, story thread. And it unlocked the whole storyline of Lisa and everything like that. So. Did this, was this something that you researched? Because I feel like when I was watching it, it was something that it was either an urban legend or maybe I had heard about it or was it a whole cloth? Cause it felt very real. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a lot of authenticity in the movie. And I think that's why it's, um, you know, getting the response that it's getting, but um, rent a friend was a really cool concept in the eighties. Uh, by Ben Hollis, and it was this uh, idea that you would rent a tape and you'd have a friend. We'd bring him home. It's an interactive conversation, and there he was on screen, you know, sort of pretending to talk to you, but it was only as interactive as the 80s could be, um, <laughs> and so something about that character and that method of having a relationship with someone that's very much one way and very much uh, you know, not in your control is kind of what made the, the horror movie uh, come out of it all. So um, uh, that, and also just like, I always thought Mr. Rogers was really creepy and, you know. I love Fred every, Rogers. Yeah, he's <laughs> a great too. guy. Obviously he is a, I literally have a picture of him painted as a saint in my house. That's true. I think he's great. But when I was a kid, I was just like, what is so creepy about this guy? He's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah a little there is a bit of a mr rogers vibe in in will wheaton's uh performance and um brian i wanted to ask you about that i, I actually spoke to will last week uh, briefly and he said that you were actually on set for the day that uh the filming of his scenes were uh you know taking place so was there anything that you picked up on in his performance that helped inform the way that you played david when you went off and shot uh, essentially the rest of the movie yeah, I mean, I think it was important for me to be there um, just to meet Will as a person because I think he's an incredible guy and um, to get a sense of the connection that he made as Andy was undeniable, um, you know, and he makes that right into the lens. But I think being there on set, I felt, you know, and I would stand in the back and I would kind of try to put myself in David's shoes and just look at him and kind of, I mean, almost fall in love with him because essentially that's what David is doing. I think that's what we do uh, when we have like best friends is on some level we fall in love with him. And so I think it was important for me to be there to kind of witness his work uh, that he was doing that day. And he, I mean, he did tremendous work. Um, and I really think that, you know, the world is going to see this whole other side of Will Wheaton. Definitely. Now, you held up the the Rent a Friend uh, tape. <laughs> was that from your own personal collection or did you go to eBay? I, or... <laughs> no, I was thrift shopping for shirts. Since I'm doing all these interviews and stuff, I wanted to make sure I'm not wearing the same shirt and everything. So, and I'm, you know, I'm a working actor, so, the, you know, the money is not flowing. Um, so I was thrift shopping for shirts. 
Sunday this week. And I was for some reason drawn over to the DVD section and I walked right up to this DVD. And I was like, you have to be kidding me right now. The universe is like working together <laughs> with all of us, which is funny because this whole process has been like that. Things just lined up for this movie time and time again. It's been really surreal. Now, tell me the truth. How many times have you, since Sunday, have you watched Rent a Friend? Zero. No. <laughs> it's more nostalgic. Like when I was prepping the role, um, you could find this footage on YouTube. And so I watched it a lot as I was making my note cards for, for my character. Um, I would just have it playing in the background and it, it, it was the best source material you could possibly want um, in or, you know, to prep for this film. Now, speaking of source material, um, John, one of the things that amazed me is that rent a pal feels like it's a movie. It looks like, and feels like a movie that came out of the era in which it takes place. Um, the production design is just insane. So as a first time feature filmmaker, how daunting was it to make your first film, first big film, a period piece? And what were some of the challenges in bringing all that together? Yeah, it's really amazing that aspect of it. Um, we have this really talented production designer, uh, Brandon Friend, and he did so much beautiful work on this movie. And luckily he had this really great sort of treasure trove to draw from, which was the house that the movie takes place in. It's right next door to my house and literally, right literally next door. And um, there was this amazing woman that lived there. Um, she, she has this whole story about um, being a, a pianist in, in World War II during USO tours. Anyway, it's, she, um, she's like an Agent Carter. Anyway, so uh, there's all this cool stuff in her house. She passed away I was, and I was friends with the family. So they were like, oh, we would love if you would shoot a move, movie in here. They thought it was really cool. So Brandon Fryman went into the house and basically unpacked all the boxes and dusted everything off and kind of set everything up. Um, and that's why it feels as authentic as it does because all of that stuff was there except for the TV and the couch. And um, so, I mean, you know, there's other props that we brought in, but it was just like really, really cool. Um, now I wanted to ask about uh, the tone of the film. It's rent a is not as straightforward a horror movie as the trailer might suggest. And for the sake of not spoiling anything, I won't reveal why that is. Um, but I am curious, how did you um, as writer, director and star respectively strike such a fine balance in storytelling and performance between sad sack drama, comedy, uplifting relationship movie to a point uh, and horror that doesn't quite tip over into exploitation. Mm. Yeah, oh, man. Um, I guess that was just the nature of the story that I wanted to tell was that it had a lot of those things mixed into it. It's, a, it's about dementia. It's, a, it's about loneliness. It's about love it's about abuse it's about manipulation you know so there's all of these um you know all of those ingredients together i guess is what kind of creates that uh that tone yeah i mean for me it was <clears throat> a lot of it was on the page that john had written um and the rest was like just approaching this story as a just a real dude struggling with his life i mean he you know, he has never really had a girlfriend. He is totally isolated. He's given up his life to take care of his mother. Um, and so it was connecting with that, that real aspect of what would it be like in this position? Like how that would affect you. And I think that's really, we're telling an every man story, I think. You know, we're really telling a story about someone that is lost, someone that is isolated, someone that is lonely. Um, which is so fascinating during this time um, because I think people are dealing with isolation. People are dealing with relationships with the screen. People are feeling all the things that David is going through. And I think people in this time, in 2020 specifically, are going to relate to this movie so much more. And to that point, you know, 
everyone is still going through various stages of, you know, isolation and, and lockdown. How do the two of you as inherently creative people stay creative? I, uh, I do a bunch of zoom plays. <laughs> so uh, especially in March, April and May, I got together with my friends and uh, we just did everything that we could, you know, and, and zoom is this weird kind of amalgamation between theater and film. It's not theater. It's not film. Um, so essentially it's just an outlet to be creative. Um, so we keep telling stories. I mean, really, that's that's what we're doing is that we're collaborating through the computer screen and we're just you just have to keep telling stories. You just have to keep putting yourself out there. And so for me, it's been a lot of readings. It's been a lot of uh, uh, table reading type material and uh, like radio shows, just whatever you can do. Now, as far as being um, a working actor, as you mentioned, are you still auditioning? Do you get the sense that things are opening back up or are, are we just around the corner from being able to do stuff again? What's, what's your sense? My sense is that we have, I have been auditioning a little bit, um, but my sense is that we're facing down another quarantine. Um, but that's just, you know, where I'm at, what I see, um, you know, I would love to start shooting again, but, you know, with that recent uh, Robert Pattinson, uh, you know, contracting COVID and uh, them shutting down Batman for a little bit, I just get the sense that we're going to have another lull before we actually turn the corner. Yeah. How about you, John? Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, it's right now I've been spending a lot of time writing because it feels like that's the best thing that I can do that isn't trying to force other things to happen too soon. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, just trying to like, like BLF said, the Robert Patton Pattinson thing is a clear example that it's just like, even with masks, everyone being super careful, there's just, there's always going to be ways for something to go wrong. And so it's better that we just all take it easy and ride this thing out and, you know, <laughs> see, the, see it through to the vaccine or whatever it is that ends this thing. Yeah, there will be more art at the end of it. I mean, we will always come back to the art. Well, it's, yeah, I, I certainly am finding that to be true. A lot of people I've talked to during this, there is still that drive to be creative and, and put stuff out. Um, now, John, you mentioned that you're writing. Are you, without getting specific necessarily, are you writing about this time or are you using this as an excuse to go as far away from current events as possible? Mm, yes, I'm using this time, like you said, to go as far away as I can. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, there's there's a few things we got kick it around uh, on what we could do next. But that's what's good about this time that we're in now is that we can have more than one thing developed and ready to go, um, you know, when things do get going again, so. Yeah, cool. Well, uh, it's nice that even though this movie is, is coming out on demand, it is getting a limited, you know, theatrical run in some places like here in Chicago, it's gonna be at the Music Box Theater, a great place. Which is uh, amazing. I wish I was in Chicago to see it there. <laughs> Well, maybe, uh, maybe someday, um, you know, we can have kind of a revival of all the movies that were supposed to play at the music box. We'll just have a big old marathon. Um, okay. But the idea of it being sort of a, a midnight uh, movie, getting people together to, to appreciate it. Um, I just, I think that's, uh, that's really cool. So um, as far as, you know, future plans, how has this affected your, I mean, I assume this was slated initially to come out theatrically or was it always this hybrid kind of plan? No, it, this is all timing. Like, had we finished the movie two months sooner, we would have been going to horror film festivals and then hearing that all of the festivals were canceled, you know, and all this kind of stuff. We, we just so happened to be ready with the movie right before the lockdown. So everyone sort of knew it was coming. And I don't know. It, it, it's just so weird that it's coming out at this time when everybody is stuck at home watching their screens. And it's a movie about a guy that's stuck at home watching his TV. And we all feel isolated. And it's, it, um, it's incredible that it's just happened that way on accident. 
circling back to what I said before, how everything during this process from conception to in you know, to where we are right now has lined up with this movie. It is so serendipitous and just like meant to be. Well, it could also be the plot of a movie. Um, <laughs> there you go. I see what you do there. I see yeah. what you do. I'm, I, I love meta commentary. Uh, but yeah, anyway, yeah. thanks guys. Congratulations uh, on the film. It's, it really is something special. And particularly that last few minutes when you kind of call into question everything that you've seen, uh, I think it just it puts a nice little bow on it. So again, congrats. Uh, people should go check it out either on demand or in theaters if they're comfortable with that. Uh, good luck with, uh, with your future endeavors. And uh, yeah, take it easy. Thanks so much, man. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Cheers. All right. Bye.